All right, let's get going. So, uh, last couple of lectures, we've been talking about a handful of uh, different things with respect to paralyzing uh, and distributing database transactions, database uh, query processing, and really any kind of uh, data management uh, that's, that a database will typically do. Uh, today we're going to focus uh, mostly on query processing. So where we ended up last lecture was this idea that you could take a bunch of operators and you could spread them out. You could execute those operators in parallel. And today we're going to focus in on a handful of specific operators and look at how those specific operators can be uh, parallelized. So uh, just quick recap of terms. Uh, there are basically two kinds of uh, things that you can talk about when you talk about distribution. Uh, sorry, distribution and parallelization. Uh, parallelization in uh, the, the terminology I'm going to be using uh, basically means that we want to spread out the computation uh, and basically take the computation and uh, try and run it faster by doing more things at the same time. Uh, and then there's a matter of distributing the data, uh, which we've talked about already. Uh, the, the intent of which is to uh, get provide some level of redundancy for the data and some level of faster access or just uh, being able to handle more data at once. Uh, so once again, uh, the focus of today's lecture is going to be on parallelism, uh, basically taking the computations that you normally would like to do uh, during query processing and running those computations in parallel. So kind of like uh, distribution, kind of like uh, spreading the data out across, uh, across lots of different hard disks or lots of different storage media, um, the, the basic idea with operator parallelism is going to be to take this, this big task that the uh, individual operator is trying to perform and partition it. Uh, take this big task and break it down into a, small, a set of smaller subtasks uh, each of which operates on some subset of the data, um, each of which looks at some fragment of the data, and as a consequence, uh, each individual unit has a lot less work to do. Uh, so, kind of like with partitioning, uh, the big question that we're going, going to try to address today is A, um, how do we take the, the data, the input to each of these operators, and split it up? And how do we uh, kind of do that in such a way that uh, each operator gets precisely the data that it's interested in, uh, precisely the, the data that is useful to it, while at the same time uh, kind of minimizing the amount of overall data transfer that has to be performed? Uh, because it's kind of relevant, uh, the, the challenges that we're talking about today um, should be really, really familiar to, uh, to you now that we've talked about uh, both external algorithms, uh, we've talked about, uh, to some degree, uh, data distribution, uh, all uh, things like RAID, all of these things kind of, they're expressions of exactly the same problem. Uh, and kind of each of them appears and ends up uh, having a very similar uh, flavor of solution. So you'll see I'll be referring back to a lot of things that we've already uh, kind of covered as the motivation or the inspiration for a lot of the operators that we're going to talk about. And um, just to further motivate why this is useful in case uh, you aren't already convinced that parallel uh, programming is useful, uh, this the same basic challenges are going to arise not only in trying to distribute across uh, multiple hardware devices, which is uh, how I'm going to present things today, but also uh, in terms of multi-core programming, uh, programming on multi-core CPUs, uh, program programming on GPUs, um, all of it is in a sense an expression of the same basic principles. Uh, so uh, everything that I'm describing today in, in the context of uh, sort of shared nothing, uh, architecture with lots and lots of physical devices, you can kind of uh, take the same basic principles and uh, implement them uh, on single, process, uh, single uh, machines with multiple processors or multiple cores. Okay, so let's get into it. Um, kind of the, the fundamental primitive that we're going to be using to discuss uh, parallelism is this idea of data flow. 
Uh, so we talked about data flow in the context of transactions. Now we're going to talk about data flow in the context of operators. So what is an operator? Let's see who's awake. What's an operator? Give me an example. Selection, thank you. All right, someone's awake. Um, so any kind of operator, uh, relational operator, uh, are the ones that I'm going to focus on today. The relational operators are going to be the ones that I'm, I'm going to focus on today. But again, kind of the same basic principles, the same basic ideas can be generalized to uh, other kinds of data processing tasks. And in fact, a lot of the, the things that we're talking about today end up getting um, their kind of infrastructures out there, uh, things like Storm, MapReduce, uh, Hadoop. Uh, each of these are, are kind of primitives that you'll see expressed in all of these systems out there. So um, I guess my point here is all of this generalizes. But for now, let's, let's talk about relational operators. So I've got my friendly little relational operator uh, sitting up there. And we'd like to be able to take that one operator and split it apart, spread it out, instantiate n different instances of it, and then have each of those instances focus on some subset of the problem. Now, the obvious question here uh, arises, I have these n operators, each of them focuses on some subset of the task, how do I take uh, the subset uh, that one operator is uh, processing and uh, generating output for and connect it to the next op set of operators? And this is kind of a general uh, problem uh, because, well, like I said, the, the core focus here, the, the core challenge that we're going to try and address is to try and figure out how to take uh, some subset of the data and make sure that it's in the right place. One of the big challenges of parallelism is basically making sure that your data is in the right place. So I have n operators for uh, operator, sorry, n instances of operator A or operator A subtask, and I have n instances of the operator B subtasks. How do I connect them? Uh, what are what, how might I visualize the, the connection between these? Uh, what what kind of sits in between there? So what kind of uh, what kind of operators might I be looking at there? Uh, sorry, let me rephrase that. Um, what are some ways that we might want the instances of operator A to communicate with instances of operator B? Merge them. What do you mean by merge them? OK, so a, each of the instances of operator A are going to be producing some sort of output. Um, and I have to be able to route that. Uh, so one of the things I'm going to uh, ask you to, to uh, ask yourselves, and I'll be reminding you, I'll, I'll be asking you as well, um, how, where does the output of operator of, of instance A1 go to? So we'll, what are, what are the possibilities, realistically? One to one or one to many. So I could take uh, every instance of operator A and send its output to one specific instance of operator B. Now, this is very nice. Uh, this kind of, uh, this kind of uh, pattern, uh, or one to one data flow, uh, is really nice because it means we don't have, um, we have this very nice localized communication graph. We have, uh, very little data transfer that has to has to happen, and more importantly, the data transfer happens in these nice uh, parallel lines. Um, if you're familiar with functional programming, or if you've taken the programming languages course here, uh, or if you're just familiar with MapReduce in general, uh, this kind of data flow paradigm uh, it mirrors the uh, map operator, the map set operator. Well, the other possibility is that every uh, instance of A needs to send data to every other instance of set B. Uh, now, how many messages might I be expecting to see in this kind of communication graph? If I have n instances of operator A and instances of operator B? n squared. So one extreme of this particular uh, form of communication graph might be that I have to send every Every message, every piece of data that gets produced by A1 has to get sent to every single instance of B1. 
Now, this is, this is not generally a good thing, uh, but we'll be encountering this particular uh, pattern in a number of different instances. Now, I should mention that this is kind of one extreme of a spectrum in this particular communication graph. Um, the other extreme is that the data doesn't actually, um, every message produced by A1 doesn't necessarily have to go to every instance of uh, B1. It's simply the, the case that um, outputs of A1 need to go to some subset of the instances of B. So this, this other extreme you could think of is A1 partitioning its fragment of the data, spreading uh, its fragment of the data across the nodes in B. You can think of this as uh, partition, uh, partition data flow. And like I said, this is kind of a, a spectrum with these two things at the extremes. Uh, in general, you're going to encounter settings where uh, the output of one instance of an operator needs to go to some subset of the downstream operators. And I'll get into that uh, when we talk about joins. Okay, the last kind of data flow paradigm that you're going to encounter is this idea of many to one. So every instance of A needs to kind of, uh, the, the data needs to be coalesced into a single, um, a single uh, data value. And what kind of, uh, what is this, uh, what kind of operator does this remind you of? Aggregate, yeah. So this, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about how you, by the way, is this going to be particularly efficient? No. Why? In terms of parallelism, does this give us, what kind of parallelism does this give us? Is A parallel? Is A parallel? Yes. Is B parallel? No. So uh, B here has to do all of the work of merging things together. So one of the things, so later on today we'll talk a little bit about uh, aggregation and different ways of kind of streamlining the aggregation process. Okay, so keeping these kind of data flow paradigms in mind, uh, what kind of, how are we going to take the, the various relational operators that we've discussed so far and parallelize them? So let's look at some basic operators. Select, project, union. Now, why do I have these operators on uh, one slide? What might be a, or equivalently, uh, let me rephrase that as, uh, in each of these operators, what is one unit of computation that I have to perform? One tuple. One tuple. So each of these operators uh, performs whatever computations it needs to perform uh, in a very localized way. You never need to see more than one tuple at a time in order to perform uh, one of these operators. And more importantly, there's no dependencies. There's no uh, interdependency between the, uh, the different tuples. You see one tuple, you do some processing, and then you send it off, and then that's it. There's nothing else that you need to, you never need to see that tuple or care about what was in that tuple ever again. Yeah. Um, so for each of these, this basically is the one-to-one. The -one. Uh, each of these can be implemented very cleanly in this one-to-one -one, uh, data flow uh, mapping. Uh, select just reads in a tuple, spits out a tuple. Reads in a tuple, spits out a tuple. So you just take all of your tuples, uh, split them up into some number of uh, bins, and then have the operator essentially f uh, send them to the next uh, next stage, whatever that might be. Any questions on this? All right, cool. So this was the easy case. This, these operators are, you know, they're really easy to parallelize. Let's go on to something a little more interesting. Joins. So if I was going to parallelize a join, um, how might I go about splitting it up into smaller units of work? Any thoughts? Where might I, where might I start? It would include a 
Okay, so I could have one table at one node, one table at another node, and then try and figure out some way of performing the join between those two tables. That's, that's a good way of approaching the problem. Uh, I will get back to that. Um, let's say that I have so much data that I can't even store it on a single node. I have to have uh, my data uh, for one table distributed over multiple nodes. Same thing for the other table. And where have we encountered this before, where we have just so much data that we can't store it on a single... Okay, so we can split the data based on the join attribute. Uh, generalizing a little bit... F okay, so y your suggestion was about two subjects forward. Your suggestion is one subject forward. Uh, what happens if, uh, even before looking at parallelism, let's try and take the simplest approach possible. What is the, the simplest join algorithm that we've encountered so far um, that nested loop join, or more generally, if we can't fit the entire thing in memory, block nested loop join. So we have uh, our basic block nested loop join algorithm uh, for every block of, uh, of R, for every block of S, we take them, we join them together. Now this is a great inspiration for a really simple uh, distributed join algorithm uh, because we can do exactly the same do we can do exactly the same thing except replacing the word block with partition. Yeah. Uh, and while I'm computing one of these sort of chunks, one of these, uh, let's call it one unit of computation, um, do I care about what's going on in any other unit of computation? No. Each of these is nicely isolated. I can compute the uh, join of block i of r and block j of s without caring about anything else going on outside of that pair of blocks. So I can create this sort of grid, uh, an uh, n by k grid of uh, join operations. And I can partition uh, my overall join into this n by k grid. Uh, Let's see who's awake. How many operations are we, uh, how many uh, units of computation do we need to perform here? N times K, yeah. So, well, basically I've got my R's. I can take the R, the blocks of R, I can send them uh, to the corresponding set of nodes uh, that need to process them. Uh, by the way, how many, if I have K blocks of S, how many nodes do I need to send uh, every block of R2? K different blocks. So my, uh, this is kind of somewhere in the middle of sending to every single node and sending to uh, the, the partition uh, data flow. So for every uh, block of R, I'm gonna send it to K different blocks, uh, sorry, K different uh, processing nodes. I'm gonna do the same thing with S, except here I'm gonna send it to N different processing nodes. And then finally I'm gonna have uh, each of these individual uh, nodes perform one unit of computation. I'm gonna take all of those nodes and I'm going to compute a union of their, uh, their outputs. And that gives me my full uh, join result. So any questions on the uh, parallel block? Yes. The question is, is the data striped? Uh, yes. So the idea is that when I say partition here, I'm going to take the data and I'm going to split it into uh, K disjoint sets. Uh, sorry, the data in S, and I'm going to split it into K disjoint sets of tuples in S, and I'm going to split R into N disjoint sets of R, of tuples in R. Uh, so in my diagram here, uh, uh, where's my diagram here? Uh, this is basically all of the tuples in R uh, initially. Now this needs to uh, wherever this uh, 
this set of tuples li is living, um, it needs to get sent to or replicated across uh, k different processing units. Uh, by the way, I while I'm kind of leaving this open-ended, um, I'm kind of trying to express this in the most general way possible, where uh, each of these processing units is conceptually a different entity. Uh, the, the physical mapping, the, the way that this actually gets implemented, doesn't necessarily need to keep each of these processing units uh, separate. Uh, I could, for example, do all of um, all of the operations that involve uh, block R1 on the same physical hardware, on the same uh, computer. Uh, that saves me from having to replicate across K different uh, physical devices. But just in terms of um, keeping this general, you can always kind of take multiple bits of computation, squeeze them together on a single machine. It's harder to do the reverse. So I'm, uh, just to keep that clear. Um, these are kind of logical partitioning. They don't necessarily need to be a physical partitioning. Um, but to answer your question uh, precisely, I'm assuming that you start out with uh, the data. Uh, I'm assuming that you start out uh, with without any replication of R. But if you already have R replicated on a set of different machines, you can use those machines to do the processing. Um, there's a bit of, round, of a roundabout way of, of saying it, but is, uh, does that address your question? OK. So the okay. So the the question is uh, if the if the logical separation uh, if the data and compute nodes involved in this uh, processing are only logically separated as opposed to physically separated, uh, then can you will that make the processing faster? Uh, and the answer is yes. Um, we'll cover that briefly towards the end, uh, but this is kind of the. Um, one of the main questions of uh, parallel query processing, you have all of these logical uh, processing units, logical data locations, and uh, a reasonable thing to ask is, how do you best allocate these logical processing units to physical uh, compute and data storage hardware in such a way that it kind of minimizes the amount of data transfer that you need to perform, and it minimizes the uh, amount of latency or, or delay uh, that you get from trying to do too much on a single uh, device. Uh, does that address your question? So uh, again, the, I'm expressing this in terms of, of a logical partitioning. Um, figuring out how to map this logical partitioning down to a physical set of uh, devices is something we'll cover towards the end of today's lecture, uh, time permitting. Okay, so this has kind of already been uh, answered in a number of different ways. Uh, how much data do we need to transfer in this case, assuming that there uh, is no overlap between the, the devices? N times K, yeah. So every data value in R has to be transmitted to K uh, partitions. Every data value in, uh, in S has to be transmitted to N different partitions. So you basically have to send uh, twice n times k messages in order to get all of the data to the right place. In the most general case, you can usually do a little bit better at least. Um, and how many units of computation did, did we just create? n times k, same, uh, same thing. We've just created a whole bunch of computation. And a logical question that arises out of this is, can we do better? So. Uh, the, the kind of um, follow-up question is, how can we use, uh, how can we adjust, let's say, our partitioning strategy? How can we uh, modify the, the one degree of flexibility we have here is which nodes we send data to. So how do we kind of 
adjust the strategy that we use uh, to send data to different nodes in such a way that we can um, streamline or, or make this, this join computation more efficient. So I'm going to introduce this kind of general notation here of a, a grid, a two-dimensional grid. Um, and the, the way of kind of interpreting this is that I have, uh, I have a set of blocks of R and I have a set of blocks of S. Um, and each one of these columns corresponds to uh, one of the sets of um, computation, sorry, each of the columns corresponds to the pieces, the, the uh, units of computation that involve one block of S. Every row involves one block of R. And so in this case, I have, in this case, I have four different blocks of R, and each block is partitioned based on, uh, based on the hash value of the join attribute. So in this case, I have uh, r.b is my join attribute, and I'm partitioning it across four different blocks. I have four different um, hash codes. So not knowing anything about uh, the way that S is partitioned, which, which of these blocks do I need to uh, send uh, block 0 of R to in order to, to uh, perform the computation, the, the join computation that I'm looking for here? Which, so, sorry, uh, each intersection, each uh, grid square corresponds to one, uh, one of these units of computation that we've introduced. So which grid squares, which units of computation, which uh, logical nodes do I need to send uh, bucket zero of R to in order to get uh, the full join result? All the columns in S. So there, oh, why am I doing that? All the columns in S. OK, so uh, can I do this more intelligently? So I'm sending this to four different, I'm sending bucket zero of R to four different nodes. Is there any way that I can streamline this so that I only need to send it to uh, a smaller number no of nodes? Okay, so there's, uh, if I partition the data appropriately, what would an appropriate partitioning strategy be? Okay, so if I take the uh, data in S and I partition it according to the same rule that I'm using to partition uh, R, then, well, for example, hashing S.B into the same set of three buckets, then all of a sudden, three of the, uh, three of the four nodes that I need to send uh, bucket zero to are guaranteed to produce no output. Similarly, uh, the number of nodes, I only need to send each bucket of R to precisely one node. And great, so picking the right partitioning strategy now reduces the total set of nodes uh, involved in this computation, the, the number of units of computation, down to uh, linear in the number of partitions, up from quadratic. Perfect. So any questions on this up to this point? Yes. We face the problem in the D A three. The thing is that you'll have to have a method to join one on top of the zero zero partition, right? So imagine you have a number say zero and then you have a four. I mean a key with zero. So zero mod four is zero, and then you have zero mod four again and zero. So you'll have again a loop method on that. Okay, um, so the question is, uh, how do you uh, perform the join at each individual node? Uh, the answer is, however you would do it on a single node. So each of these uh, units of computation can be thought of as kind of a, a, a local join. So however you would perform a local join, uh, you could use whatever techniques we've discussed for local joins uh, on that one node. Uh, block nested loop, nested loop, hash, hybrid hash, any of these are reasonable things to do uh, within one of these grid squares. 
our, our goal right now is to take the kind of big uh, problem and break it down into some individual problems that we can solve on individual machines using whatever techniques we've already discussed. Now you might, uh, this particular approach might seem familiar to some of you uh, because this is effectively uh, external hash join. Um, you're taking all of your data, you're partitioning it into a set of buckets, all of the data in R, partitioning it into a set of buckets. You're taking all of the data in S, again, partitioning it into a set of buckets, and doing that partitioning in such a way that you can be sure that everything in bucket 0 from R is only going to join against bucket 0 of S. This is external hash join. All right. Now, what is the limitation of this approach that I've just described? What kind of joins can we do with this? Equijoins. Uh, can we use a similar, uh, so now a logical question might arise, can we use a similar strategy to minimize the amount of work that we need to do uh, for inequijoins? So in this case, what do we need to do? We need to sort the data, or more specifically, how do we partition the data? on ranges. So we take the data and we want to partition it based on ranges rather than on hash values. If we do it that way, then we can effectively use a similar kind of strategy to el eliminate certain uh, partition pairs. Uh, it just, it'll be the case that we can't eliminate as many partition pairs as we did before. So let's say I've partitioned my data uh, in the following way. Um, I have uh, four different partitions, uh, 25, 50, 75 um, are my partition boundaries, uh, both for R and S. Which of these quadrants are, are relevant for a join where R.B is less than S.B? The, I'm hearing upper half of the triangle. Yep. So basically everything in the upper half of the triangle is relevant. Everything, uh, and we're guaranteed that everything in the lower triangle uh, is not going to produce any, every one of those intersecting nodes, those pairs of data, um, are guaranteed not to produce any kind of output. So Again, this is kind of the, the same basic idea as uh, ex external hash join generalized a little bit. And in this particular context, that is uh, the, you might encounter this as something called a uh, theta join uh, because well, th uh, theta is often used to represent an, a comparison operator. And in this case, uh, you're picking an arbitrary comparison operator and kind of figuring out which uh, partition pairs uh, can't satisfy that particular theta. All right, so that streamlines a lot of the computation that we need to do. Um, yeah, actually, uh, that streamlines a lot of the computation that we need to do, and uh, it's really nice if we have um, if we have a logical partitioning scheme already set up. Now, the next question you might ask is what happens if you don't have a logical partitioning scheme already set up? Uh, what happens if you, your data is already being stored on disk somewhere and you want to kind of use the partitioning scheme that you already have? Um, what happens if you're uh, receiving data from an earlier operator? Each, each of these kind of units of computation is going to produce data. That data is going to be available locally it's already going to be partitioned into this, this local set of partitions. How do you use that partitioning scheme to kind of simplify your life without trying to repartition all of your data? Uh, and we'll get into that in, let's say, five minutes uh, after a quick break. So let's uh, take a quick intermission and be back here at 540.